Good evening and a very warm welcome to the Insider Essay, your guide to living better. Join us today as we open up to new beginnings with world junior pole vault champion Mireille Reinstorf, setting her sights on gold at this year's Commonwealth Games. Sutu born, Italian raised restauranteur Alessandro Hojane's rich cultural roots are key to his success. Kalafeng Moiletzi's custom crafted bags inspired by African design prove the power of heritage in business. Artist James Delaney's Instagrammable animals hold the promise of Joburg's people returning to the wilds. Running while cooking up her must try recipes, Carmony Pather gets her New Year's fitness and food balance right. Financial expert Map Alumaku offers her advice on saving while still allowing funds to treat ourselves. And with immense force of will, training, and the support of his family, Paralympic gold medalist Peter Dupree's appetite for success in 2022 is healthier than ever. When it comes to the rewards of trying something new, consider what happened when high school gymnast and athlete Mireille Reinstorf decided to try her hand at pole vaulting. She went on to take gold at the World Junior Championships. After school, I wanted to continue jumping because I knew I could get somewhere, but I didn't know how far I could go or internationally. I only realized after I competed at the World Junior Champs and got the gold. It was totally unexpected. I love that feeling when I clear the bar and you fall onto the mats. It's so relieved feeling when you get over the height and it's also an exhilarating feeling when you get over and you fall and when you stand up, the bar is still on that height. So it's definitely that. <laughs> As a BCom actuarial science student at Stellenbosch, Mireille knows her numbers and 4 meters 15 is one she'll never forget. I was standing chatting with my coach about my last jump and the other pole vault coach came to tell us, you're first. And then my coach just hugged me and I took the flag right and took photos. It sank in and it was just so exciting. It was a lot of hard work and we had jumping sessions three times a week and the rest of the sessions I had sprinting sessions and quattro sessions, also like power and strength and conditioning to strengthen everything. With the tough sessions, I just needed to push through and know that the next session will be better. <laughs> but it's only when you're repeating it that you're gonna start all the different facets of the jump really benefit and get good technique on top of the pole. You gotta have a good run up. If the run up's good, it's so much easier perfecting the technique in the rest of the jump. Obviously the achievement's been phenomenal, which has been a major plus and breakthrough for us, but for her specifically, the way she handles it. She's been very humble, uh, very appreciative of the support, uh, very encouraging and motivating for the youngsters, something that I think her parents and myself could be very proud of. Especially since her win also broke the African women's under-21 record of Tunisian Serene Balti, which has stood since 2002. It was surreal. It's very difficult to explain. It's out of the world. It sounds a bit funny, but no money in the world can buy a gold medal. They don't hand them out. It's not that often. I'm really happy for her and for the sport as well. After a hard training session, it's always nice to relax and catch up with a friend. So why didn't you come join me? A morning strawberry picking suited the friends perfectly. Mireille and her two brothers having been raised on a small holding in Warburmskral, just outside the town of George. This is the first time that I come to a place and it's so lekker om het so met die vriende in te kan doen. Hier is my vriende in Rudai. Ek weet net meer, hy spring bouwe. So al, ek weet nie veel van iets verder nie, en dit sal altyd verskrikkelijk goed doen. I think the nature in Salabash is also so beautiful. That we have the mountain and the strawberry farm. En ek weet regtig, sy sit al die harde werk, en ek nog nooit, ek ken nie iemand meer gedetermineerd. 
of gefokus nie. Het is allemaal baat, trots op en kijk op naar. Pole vaulters, while competitive, are always willing to help each other. And it's that sportsmanship which the young champ enjoys as much as the fruits of her labor. It was very lekker ons eie arbeid te plek. Behalwe dat ons lang gesoek het, maar toe het gekry het was baie lekker. As a atleet is dit baie belangrijk om gezond te eet, want die rechte voedsel geef jou genoeg energie om die oefen sessie te deur te maak en dit help ook met soos recovery na die oefen sessie. So ja, dit is baie belangrijk om gezond te eet. Arbe is 'n lekker snack en dit is baie gesond om sommer enige tyd van die dag te eet. Ek weet nog gelukkig glad nie wat 'n skoot hoe is nie soos as ek in 'n masie na die baan kom. A change of scene was in order in between Mireille's attempts to improve her personal best and qualify for this year's Commonwealth Games in Birmingham. Prince and Cosinati was happy to oblige. Hi friends. How are you ladies? I just need to tell you how to use these. Everything happens with the brake. Your left hand brake, don't touch it. With your right hand brake, it's like your lifeline. You don't let this one go. You just keep two fingers like that. You don't need power for these brakes to work because it's, it's a disc brake. Just make sure that it's safe. Dekkie scooters sien toe, denk ek net, my reis kult my so baie. Ek weet nie of ek so baie uitsien daarvoor nie, maar ek denk aan die einde gaan het vir my lekker wees. Ek is ook bieke skrikkerig, dus nie, ek is nie so groot in Brennan en Jackie, en ek denk is meer met die pal spring. Ek is ook bieke skrikkerig, maar ek denk, Ek voel beter door as wat Rudy ek voel. Letting go for an afternoon was just the ticket for a champion who is planning to make the World Senior Championships next year and the Olympic Games in 2024. I thought it was scary. Definitely my brothers will love this. I'll bring them so they can do it. It was a once in a lifetime experience, but I think for me, I'll stick to watching the inside air. <laughs> we'll join Rude in watching as the bravest among us leap for the stars. Coming up, if Italian sutu fusion is Alessandro Hojane's recipe for success in restaurants, then being open to every African design tradition is key for Kala Feng Moilezi's hit leather goods brand. This Italian restaurant and bar has become a cornerstone of the Santon dining out scene. It is the creation of a food lover who grew up as one of six children to parents who entertained often and passed on a passion for hospitality to their son. Hello everybody, how are you doing? My name is Alessandro Mutsupi Khojane. Welcome to Jameli. Let me walk you through my world a little bit. I'm a Sutu boy from Lesotho, raised in Italy. My dad was a diplomat for the Lesotho government for a few years, for about 12 years. So by birth, I'm Sutu, raised in Rome. I got back to South Africa at the age of 12, went to school in Lesotho for two, three years, and then my first year of varsity was in Durban. And that's where I started restauranteering. So the inspiration behind the restaurant, I've always wanted to work in New York, and I've always wanted to live in New York. And when I built Jameli, I told my designer, Tristan, that I wanted the New York loft feel. Hence, the crypto windows, the wooden floors, and obviously because the floors are wooden and brown, we went with the same concept as far as the furniture is concerned. Brown chairs, wooden tables, and then also behind me, we have a mural. And the whole mural speaks about my Italian upbringing in Rome and my South African background. As you can see with the horses, there's a black horse, which is my African upbringing, and then there's a gold horse which represents my Western Italian upbringing. And yeah, that's what the mural stands for. I've always wanted to build my dad a bar. Reason for that, my dad was arguably my best friend. I lost him at the age of 18. He was very much like me. He was entertainer. So the mural basically represents my dad's journey. My dad was a shepherd till he was about 14, before he even went to Standard One. Hence the sheep. Him carrying the sheep on his shoulders as a suit man. And at the end of the piece, 
It talks about no matter what happens, just keep walking in life. Surround yourself with a great team. Advisors Mr. Khojane and in head chef Jonathan Nell, he has clearly taken his own advice. I'd like to call it contemporary Italian food, quite modern. There's quite a lot of chefy tricks and tips that we use, but the mainstay is great quality produce, fantastic cooking methods. We believe in slow long cooking. And then obviously the produce is, is, is second to none. Real parmesan cheese, real butter, real cream, top quality rice, and uh, the meats, fantastic meats. Easily among their most popular is a famed Italian dish. Wild mushroom risotto, we start off by sauteing some porcinis. Just in a nice pot with a bit of olive oil. Olive oil is nice and hot. We want to get rid of most of the moisture which will then intensify the flavor of the mushrooms. At this, the first stage would then be adding the rice just to toast it, just until the rice is hot to the touch. When it's ready, we're just adding a reduction of white wine to the pot. So as the rice has absorbed the wine, we're going with the vegetable stock. Just make sure your stock is nice and warm at a good slow simmer, not boiling, but warm. And we're gonna start adding the stock into the rice in batches. The final vital step of any good risotto is the finishing touches of adding the butter and the cheese to the liquid risotto. The process there is the emulsification. You need to combine the fat and the liquid to achieve the perfect creamy consistency. We're gonna finish it with butter and the most vital component to the mushroom risotto. Over here in the restaurant, we use Parmesan cheese but we use the authentic Parmigiano Reggiano from Italy. After wrestling, we're gonna give the risotto one final stir, and then we are ready to plate. Jameli is one of the, I would put it in the top five restaurants in Johannesburg, or the best. Uh, the vibe is great, aesthetics are great, the food is amazing. The people that come here, I mean, you always end up having a good time. The restaurant is uh, Alex himself. You know, when you come here, you come for him. And uh, the food is just a compliment of uh, who he is. I mean, he's extension, you know, and uh, that's really what it is. Family is the cornerstone of Italian life. So Alessandro is keeping his close. This restaurant is his legacy to them and the greater community. A similar spirit of entrepreneurship saw Tlalifang Moiletsi turn an everyday problem into a custom leather handmade solution. Looking for a backpack to match his African vintage tastes and finding none existed, he sourced materials, an artisan, and watched his own design come to life. Mwala means colors in Setswana Sepedi Sesotho and then in the Nguni languages it means a Mwala. We wanted a name that would not only signify the kind of friend that we are and the work that we do, but that would also resonate with other people. When we started in 2019, we were doing a lot of African prints. Because we were allowing clients to come in and request their own customized designs, over time, we evolved to use more and more leather. Likely to give Tlalefang's brand the edge this year is his master's degree and the PhD he is pursuing in a very handy subject. I'm an economist by profession, but Mewala has been a collaboration, different people building up the brand. And one of the people that we've collaborated with, who's a stylist and a designer at Mewala, is Avui. After a management accounting degree, Avu Yile Dume is studying fashion. I started working with Mibala when I was still a student at Vets. That's where I met Lalifang. I really resonated with the vision of the brand. The brand tells African stories in an authentic voice. And Mibala is by Africans for the world. Therefore, we give our clients the platform to express their voices through the designs. And we work with them in a collaborative effort to create custom-made designs. 
We also try not to have any boundaries. So we allow ourselves to be inspired by anything and everything. And a really good example of this is the shape of Azania Sasha, which is a bag that we designed in the silhouette of the African continent. Importantly, premium leather crafting is a labor-intensive process, so they're creating quality jobs in a sustainable way, which has a knock-on effect. Our customization journey has several steps. We really start with the client from the beginning, trying to get the full information, trying to understand the particular design that they need, what it needs to look like, and what they're going to use it for. And then after that, we would move on to sketching, so sketch the design or do illustrations of the design, and then after which we would do a paper prototype. The first step when we get to the leather is that Taviso here, one of our crafters, will inspect the leather to just make sure that it's at the right quality. And once Taviso is satisfied, he finds the ideal location where he can trace the template. Once all the panels for Shape of Azania have been cut, they move on to the punching phase, where Taviso will hand punch all of the different holes that we need for the stitching. It goes on to polishing and quality check, and then at that point, we will have the final product. The brand champions South African, Congolese, Kenyan, and all African fabrics. This is our travel duffel bag. Here we can see a melting pot of colors, different textures of leather. So really speaking into the story of classic meets modern. So this is actually one of my favorite pieces that we do. After getting these hides and cutting them apart to make these different cubes, you have to come back and stitch them together to create this mosaic. One of my favorite pieces. Now they are working on an interactive online platform that will make it easy for clients to customize designs using technology to deliver maximum value. We also do some vintage cases. It's reinforced with metal bracing here on the corners and it also plays around with African print and African color. This vintage case is actually very functional. And then it also has this inside zipped pocket, which is also lined with African print. My favorite part about working with leather is just how you can manipulate it. You can literally create a color in the world, make some dyes, and then give it that specific color that you want. Our competitive edge as a brand is that we embrace innovation. So far, we've managed to incorporate RFID technology into our purses and wallets. We are also not afraid to experiment with shape as a brand. For example, what better way to celebrate Africa than having a bag shaped in Azania? Our advice to aspiring entrepreneurs is that don't wait for things to be perfect before you start. Start where you are, start with what you have, start small. To this year's aspiring entrepreneurs, designers, artisans, and creatives, your skills and ideas are gold. Still to come, international artist, sculptor, and printmaker James Delaney is a creative chameleon reinventing the wilds of downtown Josie to put the people back in our public spaces. or any time of year, artists regularly reinvent themselves and from his base at Victoria Yards Joburg to exhibitions in the UK, US and Europe, this one is a master at it. Hi, I'm James Delaney. Welcome to my studio. Come on in. I've been painting and drawing since I was a little kid. And I loved working with color, with paint. Always loved the texture of it. And I found I was quite good at it. And so I just carried on all the way through school. 
through varsity and as I started doing other work, I realized I had to go back to art. It was so much in my being. And for the last 20 years or so, I've been working as a professional artist. I work across various different types of medium. So if you look on the wall behind here, you can see some of the paintings. I paint with quite a thick impasto style technique. So when you look at the canvas from the side, you see a lot of texture in it. And I like painting with trees and plants and things. So I work on this series. But then I'll move across into sculpture. And here you can see some of the sculptural pieces. They're either in stainless steel, copper, or mild steel. They are laser cut by a machine based on my drawings. So I do the drawings in charcoal on paper and then I refine them until they're strong enough that the whole image will hold together. These are the outdoor sculptures. They're much heavier steel and they're powder coated to protect them from the weather. And they go into the ground. Here's an eagle I've made recently. This has been cut from stainless steel so it catches the light where it stands. So you see a theme running through a lot of this stuff here. You've got trees and nature, you've got animals and birds. I'm a big campaigner and activist for green spaces and I've spent a lot of years working, fixing up parks in Joburg, particularly a big one called The Wilds. And I've become aware of how important it is for people to connect with nature. One of James's resolutions this January is a return to his rewilding of this 40-acre downtown park with a more social media savvy approach. I started fixing up the wilds about eight years ago and I worked for a couple of years with volunteers and we couldn't get anybody to come back to the wilds because it was a park that had been abandoned by the people of Joburg and they were scared of it. So I needed to make something which would catch their attention, would be easily shareable on social media, by taking good photos. And I was also thinking about what the city used to be. 120 years ago, there was no city here. And so there were animals roaming around. So I came up with the idea of reintroducing the animals, bringing the animals back into the urban environment. And so I chose animals that used to live here in Joburg two centuries ago. And then I came up with the idea of doing cutouts based on charcoal drawings, cutting them out of metal, and then choosing bright popping colors. If he was a writer, James might write plays instead of novels, as his creative process is closer to an open dialogue. As an artist, you can work in a solitary way, and painting tends to be quite solitary. I enjoy more working with other people and collaborating, and printmaking, whether it's lithography or the digital prints or liner cuts or woodblock or whatever printmaking process, the sculptures as well, they involve other people. So it's me in conversation with them. And together we get a much better result than if I was working just on my own. On this wall I've got some of the collaborative printmaking projects I'm working on. On the right hand side is a project with Arthur Lamini, who's a photographer, and it's a series of body prints. These ones are printed by putting paint onto a naked body and then lowering the body onto the paper and then lifting the body off again and then we're left with these images. And then after we've done that, the person has the residue of paint on their bodies and we take photographs. We've done about 25 or 30 subjects so far, but we're growing it even further. So we can do a big exhibition celebrating the human body in a kind of realistic and honest way. Printmaking for me is a really interesting set of techniques because there are so many different types. These are digital prints. They are photographs that I've taken walking on the streets of different cities. Here's New York, there's Paris, here's Joburg. And I'm photographing people walking past doorways and buildings. This is New York. There's an old guy sitting in the middle here. His name is Robert Frank. When I was walking along the street one day, I saw this old guy and it just looked interesting and I took his photograph without him noticing and afterwards I found out he was the most famous photographer in the world and I'd caught his image. He died shortly afterwards. So I took that image 
along with other photographs I'd taken over the years walking in the streets of New York of these graffiti-covered doorways, and I stitched them together into a single image. Preferring mediums which need the skill of others makes for a more social work day too. Here we are at DGI Studios, which is a collaborative printmaking space, and I'm working here with Nathaniel on a series of elephant liner cuts. So this is the printing press here, and we're going to put the plate down. Perfect. There. And then Nathaniel's going to put the paper down, and then we'll roll it through the press. So you can see how the ink is transferred from the carved lino onto the paper here. Through this we're place. doing a series in different colors. So we've got a chocolate brown version, a black version, and some green ones. And each of these is two colors. So you see there's a, let's use this one as an example, there's a light green underneath and there's a dark green on top. So each one requires going through the press twice. Printmaking is a collaboration between artist and printmaker. And as an artist, I'm free to make the drawings and come up with the concepts, but I need to work with someone like Nathaniel who can make sure that everything is correctly aligned and registered and the inks are mixed properly and the paper is clean and the studio is neat. Otherwise, we'd never be able to produce and the work that every that single print is exactly the same and that there's no difference unless the artist wants it. So, you know, as far as that goes, this project has been very successful from the beginning. We're very happy with the outcome of everything. And I think most importantly, James needs to be happy as the artist. I'm happy. <laughs> A departure from his more hand-created work, James entrusts his digital prints to Le Shoka Joe. Joe's studio does lithography on the machine behind here. And Joe and I have collaborated for 10 years, 15 years, long time. 15 years, I think, And yeah. more recently, we started doing digital prints together. We used that to sort of... These doors, I took the photographs in Stone Town in Zanzibar a few months ago. So I've done doorway series in New York, Paris, Joburg, and this is the first time doing them in such an ancient city with narrow passageways. It was quite a challenge to take the photographs. And I've used a combination of two different doorways that alternates between light and dark. Yeah, it's, it is beautiful. It was great when he chose me to do his uh, photographs like I normally do with his um, fine art prints. So, I mean, they're both fine art prints, but one it's not hand done. So there is a bit of difference, but you know, the ends are almost outstanding. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed meeting some of the people I collaborate with and seeing the different spaces that I work in. And thank you for visiting my studio. To the artists out there still to make their mark, improvise, collaborate, diversify, and may this be your breakthrough year. Just ahead, fit foodie Carmeny Pather upends the old thinking that you can never trust a skinny chef. And 50, 30, 20 is the new formula for balancing your needs, wants and savings this new year. She Who Eats Must Run is how chef and blogger Carmeny Pather reconciles her twin passions of food and fitness. She always played sport at school and figure skated competitively well into her teens. Today, she runs while her career flies. Hello, I'm Carmeny and I am the biggest foodie you have ever met. We're here in my hometown, Durban, which is why I have this huge interest in modern Indian food. But now that we're here, I feel like we should go for a run. Come on. I am training for life, really, but I'm also hoping to run another Cape Town Marathon because hopefully the Cape Town Marathon is going to be one of the world majors going forward. In my training regime, I run three times a week and I do two days of strength. Moving back to Durban was interesting because it's so different to Cape Town or Joburg, but what I love about Durban is the warm ocean and the warm people and the fact that the sun rises really early, so you get to do stuff like this. I got into the industry because I won the second season of MasterChef, 
and I went on to produce a SAFTA award-winning food travel show called Girl Eat World, which saw me travel to 10 international destinations where I met the bloggers, I ate the food, and I jumped off some dizzying, dizzying heights. Lockdown channeled that energy online where she wrote, shot, and published her latest e-cookbook about South African Indian home cooking. Hey, Candice. Hey, Carmeny, I'm so glad you're here. I have the magical ingredient. Oh my word, what is it? The saffron. Oh, hello. I knew Carmeny before she knew me because I watched Girl Eats World. And being a stylist, she's been shooting in and around my homes and I've been styling for her food shoots. What I love the most about Carmeny's cooking is it's quick, easy, and always so intensely flavorful at the end. Thanks, Candice. Yay. Today in the kitchen, we're going to be making bacon dal. The ingredients in this dish are dal with a bit of garlic and saffron. And then you've got all those beautiful spices of jeera seeds, black mustard, curry leaf, a bit of chili. And then you bring it all together with a bit of bacon at the end. It is delicious. So to this dal, I'm going to add some of that magical saffron. This stuff is the most expensive ingredient per weight because it's the stamen of a crocus flower, which is hand plucked from each flower. So if you are what you eat, and this is a bit of flour, it's gonna make you feel pretty magical. Next thing I wanna to add to the dal is some garlic. So I've just got whole cloves, just gonna break it open and get the skin off. The easiest way to do that is just to smash it. The next thing I wanna do is fry off this bacon until it's really nice and crispy. The end goal is to fry up all the spices in the bacon fat. Fat is flavor, guys, so you've got to grow with it. While this is all cooking, we're going to be doing the croutons. So I've just got an oven-proof dish, and I've got some sourdough bread. I'm just going to rip this up. Because you want this to be a really rustic kind of dish, also the more craggy the ends of the bread are, the more it's going to pick up all the olive oil that I'm about to pour over and then become really crisp and delicious. And then you put it in the oven, 180 degrees, and so they crisp, so maybe 10 minutes at most. Just want to check on the bacon, which smells so good. I mean, I've had amazing tasting food in my house since I was a child. Earliest memories are of my mom and my grandmothers and all my aunts and uncles and cousins being at the house on a Sunday. You know, it's that usual, like, long table, lots of arms, lots of food, more dishes than you could possibly eat or name. So good food has been in my blood for a very long time. Durban cuisine is special because a lot of it works on Indian heritage. There's lots of subtle spicing and it doesn't all need to be super, super hot, which I think people often get wrong. For me, an important diet for life, not just for running, is about getting your macros in the right amounts. So it's fats, proteins, and carbs. So in this meal, you're getting all of those things, which is not just important for running, but it's important for life. Okay, this bacon looks like it is almost done. It smells delicious. And you know bacon is only good when it's really, really crispy. So what I'm going to do is fry off the onions and the spices and the chili in all the bacon fats. You're getting flavor on flavor on flavor. These onions are soft and all the spices have come alive. You can smell them in the air. And now I want to put the dal, which is soft, into all of these beautiful spices. So this dish is actually a little bit controversial because Pork is one of the most divisive and offensive meats, and dal is kind of pious. So to put them together upset a few people online, but you should try it because this dish is delicious. So the judges used to always say that food needs to be personal, and I feel like the more I've traveled, the more I've eaten other food and met new people who make the food, I've learned so much from those experiences, and I've brought those into my own kitchen. Well, now it's time to eat. The collection of recipes in the new ebook was designed to feed two people with fewer carbs and less sugar. Mmm. Wow. <laughs> Crunchy croutons. Wow. That is amazing. Sure, the bacon takes it to another level. Thanks, Candace. And thank you all for joining me on my version of modern Indian cuisine and a novel recipe for a new year.
With 2022 come new goals, which may mean greater expenses. To fund these while trying to maintain a healthy financial life, Capitex Mabule Makwela asked personal finance expert Mapalo Maku how to achieve this. Where are you currently? What is your goal? And what is it that you're looking to achieve? I am actually going back to school. Oh, that is wonderful. So I'll be corresponding with UNISA, I'm taking my studies further. So I'm planning on building more funds for me to be able to pay for registration fees, textbooks mm-hmm. and tuition fees as well. All right. And where are you currently with your finances? Are you OK? Do you feel comfortable or do you feel a bit of a pinch? I'm able to save, but then I'm not able to grow. Ah, I yeah. see. So Can I'm I technically get your statement? Did you bring a statement? Sure, no worries. Um, let's see. <laughs> Statements never ever lie. I see one thing. You like to buy airtime and you buy tiny amounts. Oftentimes we convince ourselves that actually I don't spend so much on airtime. Mm. So I'll spend 20 bucks, I'll spend 30 bucks here. But when you calculate it all together, it's quite a lot of money. So I think just right from looking at this, you have to decide how much do I spend on airtime every single month. And you need to cap it and Mm. say, I'll buy for 200 bucks. If it's done, it is done. Yeah. All right. Another interesting thing I see here on your statement is that you do save. Yeah. And yet it seems like halfway through the month, something happens and you start throwing a little bit of money. 300 rent here, 500 rent there, 200 rent here. What happens then? I overspend. So I would actually visit that account that I use, which allows me to put money into that account and take it out at any time. If you are saving for a goal, I think it is very important to earmark those savings for that specific goal. And the most important thing is to make sure that you don't spend that money. Make sure that you put those funds away in an account that you cannot access as easily as your normal checking account. Capital Bank makes it easier for me to reach my goals, seeing that it offers clients for flexible savings account. So if you want, you can fix the account either as a multiple deposit or a single deposit. So it's a great way of saving money because it gives you that opportunity to be able to control the funds on your own. Do you budget? Well, honestly, no. (laughs) I would have a number in my head, but then come that particular time, you find that I actually went above that number. And the reason is you do not budget. That's the reason behind you overspending on some areas. And really a budget is telling your money where to go. So one budgeting method that you can use is called mm-hmm. the 50, 30, 20% budgeting rule. Meaning that 50% goes towards your needs, so that's your rent, making sure that you get to work and so forth. Then 30% is your wants and things that you enjoy. Mm-hmm. So budgeting actually does allow you to have fun, right? It doesn't yeah. restrict you. Then obviously the 20% is making sure that you're saving towards your goals. I think the one habit that I would say South Africans need to break is living beyond their means. And I know it's not simple because of course salaries are not increasing as much as inflation and salaries have been quite under pressure. But I think you need to start looking at alternatives and saying how can I start a side hustle to make sure that I increase my income and also Again, going back to your budget and saying, what is it that I do not need to be spending money on? So definitely for me is try by all means to live within your means. What I like about Capitec Bank is that it actually allows me to see exactly where my money is going. On the app, there is a track money option whereby you can be able to see exactly what you are spending and if you are spending more or spending less or if you are still within your budget. That said, we're all human beings, not machines. So Mapalu has some realistic advice about budgeting and saving while still allowing funds to treat ourselves and live better. I think it's definitely important to put money aside to enjoy yourself. 
I kind of compare it with trying to lose weight. If you tell yourself that you are just going to be very strict with yourself, if you tell yourself that you are not going to eat anything other than water and vegetables, you will crash. It is the same with your finances that if you want to become good with your personal finances, you still leave money for enjoyment, then it makes it worthwhile. It makes it feel like, you know what, I am on the right track, I'm trying to do the right things, and yet I still get to enjoy myself. You still want to have a full life and enjoy the small things that life has to offer. It's important for people to get out and about. Being locked up during COVID, they've been at home, a lot of them haven't returned to their offices and it's time to play. It's time to enjoy yourself. Today was quite an adventure. Um, a bit challenging, but overall beautiful experience. My day was an amazing experience. We always wanted to do this, but then we never got the chance. So going forward, we will make sure that we actually plan ahead and then be able to enjoy yourself after the hard work that you have done throughout the month or the quarters that you had at work. Mabule, I've looked at your finances and actually you are not in a bad shape. You don't have debt, mm -hmm. you definitely have to build up your emergency fund and make sure that your savings are fixed. But I think for future, I want you to think about money in a balanced way, right? So I'm not going to say don't have your morning coffee, don't do this, don't do that. I would say one of the best advice that I can give you is that if you ever want to buy a house, if you're going to buy a car, buy something that is lower than you can afford so that you still get to enjoy the simple things in life. Mm. Always, always buy less than what you can actually afford. And that is, I think, one of the key cornerstones of personal finance. To kickstart your New Year's goals, get your savings on the path to financial growth or reward yourself for a year of positive saving habits. Now you stand a chance of winning a 1,000 Rand Live Better Cash Prize. Simply reply to the competition post on the insidersa.co.za social media platforms using hashtag Live Better. T's and C's apply and can be found on the Insider SA website. Right after this, if at any time in 2022 you feel your New Year resolve slipping, let the story of our awesome gold medal winning Paralympian, Peter Dupree, keep your eyes on the prize. Sponsored by Capitech. Simplify banking. Live better. As New Year's inspiration goes, it's hard to beat out our latest Paralympic champion's path to gold. Hi Insider SA, I'm Peter Dupria. Welcome to my space. Really excited to have you guys join me for the day. Sport was a huge thing in my life, already being semi-professional before my accident. And it being a bicycle accident, it was all sport related, everything. So I want to say my journey with Paris sports started already when I was still in rehab and it started with what's called wheelchair rugby. The clubs was then, there was always spare chairs, so it was sort of easy to get into it. But the seeds were already planted in rehab by friends who showed me videos of paraplegics who actually do triathlons. That started the whole thing about maybe I can be the first quadriplegic to do triathlons, even though I was told I'll never be able to do them. Basically, quadriplegic means you've broken your neck and depending on what level, that determines how much movement you actually have. A C6 quadriplegic, which is what I am, means that I can only move my wrists, my biceps, and my shoulders. That's the only function that I have. I cannot move my fingers at all. It just looks like I am when I use my wrists. And then obviously from my chest down, completely paralyzed. But on top of that, I think the things that people don't realize is you have limited to no feeling also over the rest of your body. As quads, we can't get our heart rates up. And then also you don't sweat, temperature regulation. All of those things are things that are against you on a race day. A typical week would be, I'd probably go swimming twice or three times a week and I'd normally swim about a 3K swim. And then I would do two or three, sometimes even four sessions in the racing chair, anywhere between an hour and two hours. 
and then on the bike I do a lot of training on the indoor trainer as well as on the road but yeah I mean it could be anywhere between 10 and 15 hours of training with my hand bike and obviously doing different kind of sessions. I got a nickname Super Pit um, at Varsity and today that is Team Super Pit and that is my wife and my four-year-old son now who travels everywhere with me most of my training sessions they will be there maybe not all the time but helping me but I mean certain things like getting in out of the pool and those things you know they're always there so yeah it's a special support structure I have and I'm very privileged that my dreams became their dreams. The metal of this Iron Man was clear the day he came to the attention of occupational therapist Ilsa Duprier. I actually met Peter after his accident and as an occupational therapist but also just as me he really intrigued me from the very beginning so we kept in contact and we really became good friends during his rehab and then we just continued with that friendship afterwards and that then turned into something more and now we've been married for 13 years so it's been an amazing journey and lots of adventures together. Pitman is four years old so he takes a lot of time and he wants a lot of attention but it's amazing he just makes things work. He's really become part of the team so he really enjoys working on dad's bike and training with him. It's amazing how a little four-year-old can be so part of a team in all these things we do. Fatherhood, I think anybody who has kids can tell you <laughs> it's a uh big change in life and for me just a big change of how I think about things and the best way I can describe it is now when I go down a downhill at 90 k's an hour I do think twice about it because I am responsible for a little guy. For all Pete had come through life was not about to cut him any slack en route to the games. The lead up into this Tokyo Games it's an interesting story because, I mean, first of all, it was supposed to be 2020. Then COVID happened and there was all these uncertainties and we never really knew, is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? What are you training for? Are you sure you're still working towards it? So I kept myself, but my coach and I, you know, you sort of went on to a maintenance kind of training rather than a focused training building towards something. But yeah, then a crazy thing happened. I fell out of my day chair and I broke my shoulder, I completely dislocated the AC joint and then the coracoid process is a bone on the scapula snapped off completely. It's the worst shoulder injury you can actually get and right then I must be honest it was a career threatening injury but not just that you know I wasn't even sure whether I would ever be independent again because they, they had to put a plate in there. You know that was a mental game in itself and again just amazing how the team effort between me and my wife and my son you know, we managed to make it work. And I mean, this is going to sound funny, but when I broke my shoulder, despite all the doubt, somehow I just felt the Tokyo 2020 Games is going to be my games. Being on the road, the freedom of being on the road, the adrenaline of going like 90 k's an hour down a downhill, and just how you and your bike are just one machine going through those things. And you know the limitations of how fast you can take that corner and that freedom, that adrenaline, that unity, and the fun of racing your bike. This is a very special medal, and it's a gold medal at our Paralympic Games. This gold medal was actually a dream that started when I was six years old. I was always, since then, praying and dreaming of winning a gold medal at the Olympics. Fast forward, then I break my neck, so that dream changed to Paralympic gold, and all the lead up, Ironmans, Robin Island swims, the challenges, breaking your neck over the 35 years leading into this Tokyo Games. And then when I finally crossed that line and I was told, you've got that gold medal. Um, there was tears, luckily I had my sunglasses on. <laughs> and the emotions of just all the effort and all the sacrifices and going out and then doing it. And I mean, then you realize this is not my medal, it's our medal. And the privilege it is to create so much excitement and hope in our country during this time that we find ourselves in. You know, for me that's humbling and yeah, I don't even know if that describes it, but those were the feelings of joy and emotion and just everything culminating and sitting behind this gold medal for me. Thanks Insider SA, it was a great day together. See you soon.
Bit, you've lit a flame to drive all of us this year. Get more of the Insider Essay online. Follow, connect, engage, and be inspired to live better with the Insider Essay. Watch the show Monday evenings at 5.30. Repeat Saturday at 1 on S3.